Namaste. I was reading an article this morning about making tough decisions. It was called Looking into the Abyss. <laughs> and of course, the abyss means uncertainty. That if you take the easy path, make the, you know, the normal decision, the default choice, You'll have an easier path, a more certain path, than if you take the hard choice, take the red pill, you know, and go for uh, a more risky or more individual path. But if I had to say there was one single factor that influenced or enabled my success in spiritual life, more than any other, it's the ability to make these tough decisions. And what is a tough decision? Well, I'll give you an example. In fourth grade, my uncle, who was an aeronautical engineer, gave me a slide rule. For those of you who aren't old enough to remember, a slide rule <laughs> is a piece of wood with a sliding scale in the middle that you could use it to make mathematical calculations. In other words, a manual calculator. So, very nice. In fourth grade, we were supposed to memorize all these multiplication tables, which I found terribly boring. So I said, oh, I'll just use this here slide rule instead. And of course, my teacher caught me and told me it was cheating. And I argued with her, wait a minute, Using a slide rule is college-level work. I should get rewarded, not punished. She didn't like that, so she sent me to the principal, where the same conversation repeated. Still no resolution, so they called for my mother. And my mother is really cool. She made a lot of tough decisions in her life. She came and said, Why are you giving him a problem? He's doing advanced work. He's very smart. They still punished me. And at that point, I realized school is not about education or learning or knowledge or even skills. It's about social control. And because I was not willing to follow the authority, because what the authority was saying was stupid, they punished me sent me back to the second grade for two weeks. <laughs> like this was supposed to stop me, right? At that point, I decided for my own education against the school, because obviously the school was not interested in actually educating me, merely controlling me. So during school hours, I was just an average student, I tried to stay low, uh, under the radar, not cause any trouble, and I skated by with C's and B's. But after school, I went to the library, and my mother had given me a letter. I could take out any book I wanted. I could read anything in the library. So I did. <laughs> and I gave myself quite a good liberal arts education by the time I was in high school. Another thing happened in high school. I was a physics prodigy. I guess reading all those books had some effect. <laughs> I got perfect scores on my college board's exams, except for geography, I think, or social studies, which to me was just purely propaganda about nonsense. But anyway... As far as the scientific stuff and English, perfect scores. So I got a scholarship to MIT in nuclear physics. I had done a science project about some aspect of nuclear physics. 
and I turned it down. I rejected it as a protest against the Vietnam War. And everybody told me, this is a mistake. You're doing the wrong thing. This is terrible. You'll never be a success. Guess what? I was a success anyway, <laughs> more of a success. And at this point, a pattern started to emerge that when you have to take a tough decision like this, it's usually in the form of myself, my benefit versus the world, the individual versus the group. And whenever you decide for the group, that moves you towards mediocrity. And whenever you decide for yourself, that moves you toward the ultimate success of self-realization. And the reason I can say that is because here we are, I'm 75 years old, and I have attained such a high state of self-realization that I never dreamed was possible in one human life, especially in a life that started out as inauspiciously as mine did. I was born into a very dysfunctional family, not to get into the details, but when I went off to college, to conservatory, music school, I decided to leave my family. Another tough decision. And of course, they wanted me to stay, get a good job, and help support the family. But I didn't agree with what the family was doing. So I left and I supported myself with summer jobs, uh, working on early computers and stuff like that. Jazz gigs on the weekend and so on. It benefited me. It didn't benefit the group. And as a result, I caught a lot of criticism for that. I could go on and on and on about tough decisions I made that were good for me, but bad for the group, for the individual, against the organization. And while they turned out to be difficult in the short run, they were very beneficial in the long run, to the point that well, let me give another, the biggest example. When I had a group, an, an ashram, with a group of so-called disciples, I was trying to bring them to the stage of spontaneous bhakti, spontaneous love of God. I was trying to at least open the door because we had all been trained on the ISKCON Srila Prabhupada's books uh, the philosophy that following the regulative principles, which is really karma yoga, will give rise to love of God. And I didn't think that was true. Uh, my experience was when my uh, karma was complete, when I had let go of all aspirations for position, name and fame, power, wealth, and so on. At that point, my devotion became mature and I developed love of God spontaneously. Not by trying to develop love of God, <laughs> but by getting rid of all the other stuff that was in the way, mainly ego. But you see, the organization always wants to stress the development of ego because a person with ego has an identity and an identity can be exploited and controlled through sticks and carrots, huh? reward and punishment. So if you let go of ego and you have no more identity, no more uh, hard and fast rules about who you are, you can't be controlled anymore. You can't be exploited anymore. And so the group is always against that. The group think is always, always on the side of the preservation of the group. 
And in the short term, you can get benefits from the group, but they're all external. They're not internal satisfaction like you get when you follow your heart, when you follow your integrity, when you decide for the individual, for the self. So I would have to say, looking back over like 60 years or more of sadhana, I always decided for God. I always decided for sadhana. I always decided for the individual and not for the organization. And because of that, I lost my ashram. I lost my so-called disciples, bunch of rascals. And then I started to notice another pattern, very interesting pattern, that those who opposed me in making these tough decisions, after that came to a bad end. Let's go back to high school when I decided not to accept that scholarship to MIT. Some of the other kids who were in the STEM program science, technology, engineering, and math were really critical of me. Oh, you should have taken that scholarship. There was another boy in the same class who got the same scholarship. John was his name. And so John and several other students from the immediate area who got this scholarship drove up to MIT to accept it in an awards ceremony. And on the way, the driver fell asleep at the wheel. They crashed into a bridge abutment, and everyone was killed. This was before seat belts and crumple zones and roll bar reinforcement uh, in cars. They were all killed. Even this had no effect on the other students. They say they still said, "No, you should have taken that scholarship." But you know, a few years ago. When I was on Facebook, I'm, I'm off Facebook now, so. but in those days I was still on Facebook. I looked up some of my old classmates, some of the very same people who had criticized my choice to go f to follow my heart, follow my star, my ambition, to be self-realized. They were still doing the same nonsense. <laughs> One of them, his name is Joe, and he was like, this was like 10 years ago. So it was, I was like, he and I are both, were both like 65 at the time. I contacted him through Facebook. And the only thing he could say was complaining about his psoriasis, his skin disease. We, we couldn't have an intelligent conversation. I came to the conclusion he was suffering from early stage dementia. And uh, the same with my other friends that I was able to locate. And especially the ones who had criticized me and bullied me in middle school and high school, a lot of them turned out in jail, dead, insane, addicted to drugs, and so on and so forth. And the same with the, my ex-disciples. If you looked them up, if you can even find them. <laughs> one went insane. Another one opened his own ashram, and as far as I can tell, he's still alone there. Still stuck exactly where he was 12 years ago when this all happened. And the others are similarly just completely stuck. They haven't made any spiritual progress in all this time. Whereas I've been in and out of, you know, <laughs> all kinds of things. <laughs> and you can see from the history on this channel, all the different things that I've studied and benefited from. And finally, got the ultimate self-realization. The full enlightenment. Realization of Brahman. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Oh, Namah Shivaya. <laughs>